Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The impacted third molar uh, is a frequent problem in the mandible. Our patient today uh, is 28-year-old Robert Tavernier, uh, and we will have a look at his left mandible. Just open, please, Bob. Uh, we will see that he has a temporary filling in the second molar. This uh, cement uh, temporary filling is in the second molar position. The third molar is farther back here in a partially erupted condition. And uh, we will see it now in the radiographs uh, to indicate the posterior bite wing film showing a mesioangular uh, position and uh, some periodontal problems will emanate from this uh, position of the tooth. We'll look at the periapical now and see the root formation and the proximity to the inferior alveolar canal. Uh, with this, we have approached the patient in a combination of pre-medication and uh, also have administered an inferior alveolar block and long buckle <coughs> injection to handle the anesthetic requirements of the case. In order to stabilize his mandible, we will insert this uh, rubber bite block into the opposite side of his mouth, placing it well back and asking him to close on it. That will stabilize his mandible as we work and will also inform the patient that while we have him in this uh, position, even though we retract to the left, we we'll want him turned a little bit toward me. We'll then approach the gingival sulcus with a 15 blade, making an incision in the interproximal, and then the retromolar incision must be made with care to be certain that we stay on bone. We'll make that about two millimeters posterior to this last tooth and come up into the posterior area. And I'll come along the lateral surface and uh, complete the free gingival margin incision. After the incision is completed, we'll proceed with the periosteal elevator, small end of the periosteal elevator. This goes down to the depths of the papilla and reflects the papillae out laterally and uh, we try to stay on bone. We'll reach a point where it's necessary to use sharp dissection as well as uh, we can have the blade again. We're using a combination of the retraction of the flap with a periosteal elevator and a knife blade dividing the adhesions as we proceed with this flap reflection. A little more suction, please. Sometimes the adhesions are rather dense around the periphery of the tooth. I'll take the 15 blade then. But you can see the periosteum is gradually being divided. And we have the retromolar bone exposed. And this is about the extent to which the flap will need to be reflected. Necessary to get sound bone exposed and we'll be, take a good look at that in a moment. 
When the flap has been reflected this way, we'll switch the elevator to the broad end of the periosteal elevator, and we'll insert that then beneath the uh, flap in this manner. Turn a bit toward me if you can. Now, uh, now back to the left again a little bit. With this uh, small round drill, we'll be just relieving some bone on the buckle. We'll irrigate this well and uh, Irrigate. Little vibration and noise here now. All right. Uh, I think we'll try to get a little more light in that field. We may have a mirror. We'll hold the mirror down while I'm in here like this. Suction, please. Suction right in there. That shows you the buccal surface of the crown, the cortical bone, and the small trench that's being cut on the lateral right along here. All right. Thank you. This is carried down to a level below the greatest convexity of the crown of the tooth. Now with adequate suction, I believe you'll be able to see the mesiobuccal groove, the distal buccal, that's beautiful, yeah, it's fine, and the deep trench that's here. Now we do have reasonably established grooves in that tooth. And uh, we'll try to divide this by sectioning it with this bi-bevel chisel. And uh, we'll place that in the mesiobuccal groove. And I think we might come out not quite so tight on this if we can once we see where that's positioned. And Bob, I'd like to have you uh, bite firmly there for a moment. Just bite down firmly. And we'll, uh, there'll be a little tap here. Bite firmly. Now you will see, let's go back in tight. Can I have periosteal elevator, please? You'll see that that chisel has fractured. You'll see the chisel in position and how the inclined planes of the chisel have split the crown of that tooth uh, right along the mesiobuccal groove. That provides us some space. You can see again down below the trench below the greatest convexity of the crown. And we'll approach this next with the small uh, elevator. This is a dental elevator, 77R elevator. And with that, we'll insert it into the space where the tooth was sectioned. And uh, I'm sliding the broad end of the periosteal elevator again under the flap, resting it on bone so you can see that uh, is as traumatic as possible. And we'll take this elevator and go in and section out the, bring out the distal of the crown that was fractured off. We'll uh, grasp that with a hemostat, and uh, that will give us space on the distal into which we can rotate the remainder of the uh, crown.
So we'll see about the adequacy of this space. The elevator is now being placed on the mesial. And as it goes in between the crown of the tooth and the bone, we'll rotate it toward the tooth to be removed. That's a rotation toward the distal, lots of pressure, Bob. A rotation to the distal and a downward motion of the elevator handle in that manner. So we have here the mesial of the crown and the mesial root. And uh, we will still have, of course, the distal root remaining. Whether or not we'll be able to see that is somewhat questionable because it's at a low level. But let's irrigate it well, please. And as we, we might try an angle change, uh, turn your head a little, that's it, good. You can see, actually see the uh, root canal of the remaining distal root down in that position. Now you can see that it's surrounded completely by bone. Since it's surrounded completely by bone, I'm unable to get an elevator on it. So I'll have to use some small pick elevators to uh, attempt to manipulate that. I'm going down with the small round drill again. And on the buckle, I'll attempt to make a small groove in this root. I should like to uh, irrigate that again slightly, please. That's good, and then suction again. All right, thank you. So now I have the distal, a small traction hole in that distal root area. And taking, <coughs> we can suction it again. Taking this small pick elevator here, we'll approach it on the distal buckle and attempt to bring this forward. Be a little bit of pressure again, Bob. It may be that the pathway for delivery is not adequate, but we'll see if there's any motion there at all. And there is. The root starts to come forward. And you can see the little crevice that's gained on the distal, suction it again. That's fine. A little more light. That's good. So it's starting to move, and it will uh, hopefully be delivering up. We advance the elevator, suction and irrigate it so we can see it again, please. A little irrigation. <coughs> suction again. That's it. Fine. It's uh, moved now toward the mesial, as it's locked there. And I'll take the other pick elevator and see if we can move it toward the buckle. Come in behind it this way. And we'll try to, again, bring it forward and up. This is the beauty of the pick elevators. You can see a little motion in the other direction now, going out toward the buckle. I'll go back to that uh, elevator, and you also might give me a little curette. I'd like to demonstrate how the curette, just the double-ended curette, can be, well, I guess it's a little late. We got it out with that. All right. So we'll approach this uh, distal root and bring it up in this manner. Now, We'll carefully examine the roots, making sure that they're all present and accounted for, and that you don't leave any inadvertent small uh, fragments there. And as you look at it carefully, I think everyone will diagnose the periapical foramen, or the actual the apical foramen, which is more clear in the camera than we can see it live. Magnification of television. D 
doing much for us in this uh, demonstration. This leaves a bony uh, crevice then. I mean, uh, let's look here for a minute. All right. I'm going underneath the flap. We'll irrigate this well. And uh, we'll check for the position of the flap. You'll recall this was not an uninterrupted condition, so there's quite a little space. We don't need to trim that flap at all. We'll give our patient a little rest, something that we must remember even when we're making tapes. It gets tiresome. This prop has been very helpful to the patient, now bite down, and to us as well, because it has stabilized his jaws. And when we used that bivalve chisel, the muscles of mastication were supporting the jaws so that uh, they did not uh, get jarred uh, up in the condyle, and so the mandible was stabilized. Into this bone defect, <clears throat> we're going to place a small pledget of gel foam. This sponge is absorbable. And we are going to, uh, it has been impregnated with 50 milligrams of tetracycline, known to be helpful in its adherence to bone. And it has been helpful to us in reducing the amount uh, of breakdown in clots in bone defects. So we'll return with a prop to our patient and uh, have him again stabilize his mandible in position. Just close on that again, Bob. And we'll take out the, the pack. All right. And then we'll slide. Uh, let's get him in proper position again. And we will slide underneath the flap again with the periosteal elevator, reflecting the flap. And then into the central area of the defect, we'll place this tetracycline sponge. There'll be a blood clot that develops around that, but that will occupy the central position. Then we'll proceed with a return after we're sure that there's nothing underneath the flap here, a suction underneath the flap. And we'll return with the insertion of sutures. We'll begin with an interproximal suture. This is 3-0 silk. It's on this swedged on atraumatic needle. If I might have a mirror. Uh, we'll begin here at the base of this papilla, go through the base of the papilla, underneath the contact point, and uh, pick it up on the lingual. As it comes through the lingual, we are, I'm just going to retract his tongue out of the way slightly. If it comes through the lingual, it has not engaged any tissue. It is just under the contact point. We then will draw it through completely, or just leaving about two inches of suture on the end, reverse the needle, and carry it back, again engaging the same approximate quantity of tissue on the lingual as we come through the base of the papilla. So on the pass back of this figure eight stitch. We are going again through the base of the papilla on the lingual, and we'll be going under the contact point, which with this temporary filling is a little bit uh, difficult to assess, but uh, it's there. And as we come up on the buckle, where again, as you see the needle emerging, it is not engaging any tissue. The only uh, engagement of tissue is on the buckle. So that is the figure eight stitch, which we'll now tie, and it will hold the papilla on the buckle into position. Uh, I will want to demonstrate a little something there in a moment. We'll now place a suture distal to the second molar. And I'm wondering if we could get back to the 
retractor here. I think we might see a little more and keep this uh, hirsutism under control so we don't have any confusion with the embroidery. There we go. On the distal then, it's not going to be possible for us to pass through both of them margins at the same time and control where we want to pass them. So we'll go through just the buckle and one pass. And then when we come through on the lingual side, I want to wrap that tissue around the distal of the second molar. So I will bring the stitch in as forward and low a position on the lingual as possible. Difficult, or we're not angled for that, but you'll see that I'm coming forward with the needle and uh, it will have a tendency as we tie this suture then to uh, wrap the tissue around the distal of the second molar. While we are viewing this uh, temporary filling on the second molar, I'm reminded that in surgery, with the use of the types of instruments that you've seen, the potential for abuse and accident is very great. Now, as we've tied this, I'm going to move the knot away from the tissue defect and bring it out toward the buckle. That's what I've done with that little maneuver, and we'll tie our, cut our sutures about that length. Getting back to the question of accident with large and heavy instruments, if patients do have faulty or somewhat questionable restorations, uh, they will, uh, we should know about them and the patient should be informed uh, that the removal of an adjacent tooth may mean some threat to the tenure of any uh, questionable restoration. So tell your patients for whom you are doing surgery that you're certainly going to be as careful as possible, but in the event that the removal of the tooth involves the loosening of this uh, adjacent filling that is already partially loose, they won't attribute it at all to what you have done. So, and also if you're working around particularly fragile restorations, porcelain veneers and porcelain crowns, we're careful about that as well. Well, we have now returned the flap to place. Uh, I would like to uh, show one other aspect of the closure. The uh, buckle flap has been returned to position, the epithelial attachments where it belongs. And we will now place a moist sponge over the operative site. We'll place it on the buckle. We'll place it in, always in a position where intermaxillary uh, closure will tend to bring the soft tissues back against the bone. So Bob, if you'll open now, please, a little. We'll take that out and we'll ask you to close, bite right down firmly. So that will, if we can come out, we'll see that that sponge now is over the flap, adding further uh, to the hemostasis. He's instructed to bite down on that for another 30 minutes and we'll cover his post-operative course with adequate uh, considerations for analgesia, uh, full pain control, and what he's uh, to be instructed to do. So he has had the odontectomy of number 17. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.